cars dominate the world of personal transport. The industry sectors built around them are so large that they are their own category of geopolitical power players. For the first half of the 20th century, the Americans dominated that market. They invented the concept of the assembly line, at which the car could be put together out of small parts stored at factories, making said car cheaper for an even larger market. Then came post-war Japan. In the 1960s, they invented a new manufacturing approach called just-in-time production, or demand-dependent production. Instead of having every part of every vehicle made and stored in the same factory, all parts were made separately in different factories by different competing businesses around the country according to demand. The decentralized yet coordinated system lowered production costs as well as surplus costs. This system was so efficient, it made Japan the biggest car manufacturer in the world by 2000 and was copied by everyone else. The reason it worked so well is because Japan is one of the best internally integrated countries in the world. At the core of a functioning economy lies the supply chain, which is the chain a product or resource goes through to get from supplier to producer to the customer. The aluminium goes from the mine to the plant to the harbour to the ship to the engineer to the assembly line to the ship to the customer. For that process to run smoothly, what you require is a good internal integration. The less barriers, the smoother the supply chain runs, the more efficient the production process. Japan has some of the best infrastructure in the world, some of the best educated supply chain management in the world and the foreign policy built on eliminating trade barriers, allowing for suppliers, manufacturers and customers to be smoothly integrated into one functioning system. Internal integration is important to business management, which is why many who study economics study to become supply chain managers. And the process of internal integration is also important to the functioning of a state. Nations, however, face a far greater challenge in internal integration than just economic. France is not French. There are dozens of languages spoken in France by various unique cultures all around the country. The language we know as French evolved out of the use of Latin in urban centers of administration under the Romans. This intertwined with Gallic dialects over the centuries, developing a Gallo-Romanic language family but also saw new Germanic languages arrive through the Frankish conquest. In Brittany, people kept speaking Breton, an old Celtic language that has more in common with Welsh. Gascon, Lothringian, Catalan, Basque, and Corsican are all languages that were widely spoken in regions of France and still are. For most of its history, this didn't matter, as France's governing power came through we have a king. The king is absolute and rules all of you because God says so. Then came a change in management. And with that change in management came a need to find a new way of holding all of this together despite its differences in culture, language and peoples, for which the new management chose a policy of lingual integration. French, as previously spoken mainly in urban centres, became the central language of administration, academia and culture. We are French because we all speak French, and through being spread across lingual barriers internally integrated what we now know as France. Internal integration is not always possible. An island can't rule a continent. It can also fail. Declaring someone part of a union doesn't make it so, just because you wish for it. And there is no geographical region that is as badly integrated internally as the Indian subcontinent. The landmass we now know as India drifted away from the African continent 90 million years ago and crashed into Asia around 50 million years ago. And it keeps pushing itself into it, creating the world's largest mountain range, which for its part drastically reshaped Asia. The mountains prevent rain clouds from the Indian Ocean from reaching Central Asia, consequently causing the vast steppes and deserts there, as well as generating an annual rain season known as the monsoon. The constant downpours and glaciers of the Himalayas several rivers to flow from them into the Indus Valley and the Brahmaputra Plains. The Indus, the Jhelum, the Chenab, the Ravi, the Beas, the Sutle and the Saravasti. This large river landscape combined with large flood zones made India, just like so many other large river delta regions, an ideal place for early agriculture based settlement and civilizations, which culminated in the Indus Valley civilization. Across the subcontinent, many independent kingdoms formed around the river cities. By 600 BC, 
sea known as the 16 Majapadas, mainly situated along the Ganges River Valley. This established a tradition of small local rulers who built small kingdoms throughout the Indian subcontinent, who all competed in trying to expand their influence and power over that subcontinent. What they would be called would change over the centuries, yet many of their castles still stand to this day, and in many of these castles, the descendants of those kings still live their lives in an India that is now without an emperor or king. Yet the various provinces of India to this day remain in contention with the central federal government. Power struggles between central power structures and regional power centers are common in India's politics throughout its history. And throughout the last 2000 years, ruling all of this, one of the most fertile and rich lands on this planet, became a prospect of such desire that many, both internal as well as external, tried to take it all. Throughout its history, there were six unifiers of the subcontinent. The Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire, and the Republic of India were all internal unifiers. The Delhi Sultanate, the Mughal Empire and the British Raj were of external origin. Before the British, those who sought to invade the Indian continent always came through the same region. At the Himalayas' westernmost tip, at the Badakhshan Highlands, the impassable Himalayan mountain range gives way to smaller ranges such as the Hindukush Mountains, from which the land gradually flattens out into fertile plains in Afghanistan and Persia. This corridor is the main route through which outside conquerors, be they Persian, Greek, Mongol, but mainly Turkic, launched their invasions of the subcontinent. It, therefore, comes as no surprise that this region, which today is split up between Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, India, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, is of vital interest in the security and trade of the inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent and, therefore, still a source of conflict. The British, as always, came by sea, initially not as a nation but as a company to establish a trade factoria to build networks for goods. They were, however, not alone. After the French were kicked out of India, the East India Company took French possessions as well as the lands of Bengal, whose ruler had sided with the French and lost. The British created the Bengal Presidency and from there started a process of gradually taking control of the entire subcontinent. They did so by taking advantage of conflicts between the Marahatas and the Mughal Empire, Persian conflicts with the Mughals and established a system of tributaries. This colonial rule of India was however very different from all previous and other entities that had united India. It was first and foremost managed by a corporation, namely the East India Company. Where previous conquerors had made the subcontinent their new home, the East India Company was there to profit and take its resources and wealth for a place on the other side of the globe. This corporate profit-motivated rule was ruthless, cold and brutal, with close to little regard for the needs and well-being of those subjected to it. The beginning of company rule in Bengal coincided with a famine in the wider region, to which the East India Company did not react with attempting to bring relief, but by raising the company enforced taxes to ensure that the company profits would still rise despite the crop failures, thereby exacerbating the famine. The profit motive politique eventually led to a rebellion that would bring about the end of company rule, after which the British simply annexed India, made the British monarch its emperor and established a viceroy. But India still remained first and foremost a colony that existed to have its riches plundered for the profit of a faraway land, and that profit motive remained deeply ingrained in how the subcontinent was governed. In 1876, the monsoon failed again and India was gripped by a famine again. A famine that would end up being so large that it would cost the lives of 5 million Indians. And while it was ongoing, the British Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton, refused relief as he sold the remaining rice and grain. He justified this by arguing that the famine was part of free market forces that were naturally destroying the uncompetitive Indian rural peasantry. It was measures like these that contributed to an already existing widespread resentment towards British rule amongst the Indian public, creating a protest and self-determination movement that also happened to fall into a global era of nationalism and self-determination. From China to Anatolia to Egypt to the Balkans, movements were birthed that generated new identities. And in India, an idea was born that saw India as more than just a subcontinent of different peoples and faiths, but as one nation and one society.
During the Second World War, two and a half million soldiers from the Indian subcontinent found themselves fighting a war against tyranny, from Singapore to Hong Kong, in Egypt, Libya and Tunisia, in Italy, in Ethiopia, in Malaysia and Burma. They fought, suffered and gave their lives in the hundreds of thousands for the freedom of others, but not their own. While their homeland had to endure another famine in 1943, that war fought for freedom made the hypocrisy of a British-occupied India blatantly obvious to all and the continuation of the British Raj untenable. Internal and outside pressures started to mount on Britain to get out. But as they got out of India, they would arguably leave behind some of the worst damage done to the subcontinent, possibly the worst of all colonial legacies. At the beginning of the independence movement, the vision that had brought people together was one of a united India. You can see this represented in the flags of the movement. A society not divided by its many cultures, languages and faiths, but one republic for all. That vision was represented by the eventual founder of the Indian Republic, Jawaharlal Nehru. But it is a vision that was challenged by the leader of the Muslim League, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the eventual founder of the Pakistani Republic. Jinnah believed that in a united subcontinent, the Muslims would as a minority get the short end of the stick and that therefore the Muslims of India would need their own state. The British eventually agreed to his demands and drew lines as borders that in retrospect didn't make much sense. They ripped apart communities, cut ethnic groups and cultures into different countries and stripped the Sikhs of their ancient capital and holy sites. The British were given only 11 weeks to get out by their government. That hasty, unorganized retreat resulted in abhorrent violence and ethnic cleansings that cost the lives of up to 2 million people and caused the second largest refugee crisis in human history as 14 million Sikhs, Muslims and Hindus fled into a new country by leaving their home behind. Two visions stood at the end of India's independence and there were many that came to challenge them. The Republic of India, founded by Nehru, the vision being of a united republic of differing peoples, cultures and faiths, united for a common benefit and struggle in one society, a nation in which it would not matter that Hindus were the majority because the concerns of all would be given equal weight and precedence in a new secular republic. The Republic of Pakistan, which is easily confused today for being intent as an Islamic state. But that was not the vision of its founder Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah's ideal was what he had seen in Ataturk's Turkey, the creation of a new modern national identity in which the peoples would be Pakistani first, Muslim second, and although mostly Muslim, it was supposed to have a place for those who were not. The Pakistani Republic started with a Hindu minister of justice who presided over the first constitutional session, meaning that his signature, the signature of a Hindu, was the first on Pakistan's constitution. The Indian Republic also started with Muslim members of government, but both the visions would be challenged from Islamic extremism in Pakistan to Hindu fanatics in India. And in one of the two, the founding vision would die soon after the Republic's founding. Pakistan is an acronym, Punjab, Afghan, Kashmir, Hindus, Sindh and the Tan represents Balochistan. It was supposed to represent a unification of all these people into a new national identity. But the name itself almost stands like a metaphor for the disunity of the country. The region of Punjab is divided between Pakistan and India. Punjab is the historical homeland of the Sikhs and its capital Lahore was the ancient capital of the Sikh kingdom. Lahore was once the most diverse city on the Indian subcontinent, a place known for its culture, wealth and learning. Its Sikhs and Hindus were driven out when the city fell into Pakistan, the scar of the ethnic and sectarian separation and cleansings sits deep in the first letter. The borders between Afghanistan and Pakistan were drawn not by Jinnah or by the Afghans, but by the British after attempts to conquer Afghanistan. It is called the Durand Line, named after a British colonial administrator. And just like all the other colonial border lines named after colonial administrators everywhere in the world, it is a disaster that makes close to no sense. Drawn after an Afghan-British war to determine what belongs to Britain and what belongs to Afghanistan, it cuts straight through Pashtunistan. The Pashtun people were historically never part of the Indian subcontinent, but of Afghanistan. This loose border that cuts straight through a people and culture would end up being the source of some of Pakistan's worst internal conflicts. 
Kashmir is for most not even part of Pakistan, so the country is partially named after a part of the country that isn't even part of the country. The Indus River is the most important lifeline of the Pakistani nation. It's also important to the founding of a new national myth, as it is the region where the first Indian civilization came to be. There is no ancient historical reference point for any nation that one could call Pakistan. And the Indus River, as important as it is for the Pakistani economy and life, is also one of the countries biggest strategic liabilities because the origin of the river is in India. More on that later. Sindh, just as Punjab, is scarred land marked by the displacement of the Sindhi Hindus and Sikhs as the historical region is also divided with India of which the Indian parts are now part of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Balochistan. Balochistan has close to no historical cultural connection to India. The Baloch people, language and culture are Persian Turkic. Historically, the Baloch people were part of the Kalat Khanate, a Turkic Mongol kingdom with a Khan that was part of the Durrani Empire based in Afghanistan. To this day, the Baloch people see their identity and belonging as an independent, self-determined people and not as part of the 20th century construction that is Pakistan. And then there's also what's missing. When Pakistan was founded, it was a divided nation between West and East Pakistan. When Ataturk founded his republic, he built it on the basis of an extensive Turkification of the Anatolian region. Jinnah attempted the same, chose Urdu as the national language and attempted to create a national identity based on the cultural practices and identities of the Muslims of the western part of the subcontinent. The people of East Pakistan, however, are Bengal. They speak Bengali. Their culture was different, and as Pakistan made no space for them, the disintegration was furthered by the enforcing of a foreign language, foreign culture, and foreign rule upon a people. The cracks in the Pakistani Republic appeared within the first years. Its first Hindu minister, meant to show that there was a place for a Hindu in this state, left the country in protest, proclaiming that it was no place for non-Muslims. Within two years, the Pakistani constitution was amended to declare government office an Islamic duty excluding non-Muslims from many offices. And in 1974, those cracks were widened when the Second Amendment to the Pakistani Constitution was passed, which declared Sunni Islam the only recognized faith of the state, thereby declaring all Shias, Ahmadiyya, and Sufis to be apostates and also enshrined non-Muslims in the state to not being people with inalienable rights and fellow citizens, but merely as tolerated outsiders. The last shreds of what the initial vision for the state was came crashing down in 1977, when during a military coup, Zia al-Haq seized power. We started off uh, from, uh, from a point which, in my opinion, was most pertinent from the point of view of impact on the society. And impact on society, in my opinion, is from laws uh, which look a little stringent. Many people say that the Islamic punishments that you have instituted are in fact barbaric and inhuman and in fact contravene the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. What would you say? No, I would say that these uh, punishments are just right. They're not barbarian. They're not uh, against the human rights. But... Uh, but how can you say that, sir? Because I, I give you, because there are these serious punishments like stoning a man to death, chopping off a hand, or uh, the lashes. Um, uh, the lashes are also being administered scientifically. Well, we filmed yes. in uh, Saudi so Arabia a, a flogging which was just a tapping which was to humiliate. Yes. What ha is happening here is different. Yes, but this what has happened here so far has not happened under the Islamic laws. It has happened under the martial law. How can you say that you don't contravene the Declaration of Human Rights, if you stone somebody to death or you chop off somebody's hand, there's a case coming up in Multan, for instance. It has already been through, practically. Has the hand been amputated? Not yet. It will be. Most people would call that inhuman. Yes, but this is the way of life. This is the way of thinking. I think it is, it is absolutely within the rights of human beings because if today we can reform the society by some stringent measures, I think it will put them right. Is it reforming society? I, uh, this is my way of thinking. Zia al-Haq made Sharia the law of the land, the cutting off of arms, censorship for media, a rape victim needing to provide free male witnesses to her rape or else she would be sentenced to death for adultery. It is one of only two countries in the world where a woman could be sentenced to being raped. Pakistan went through an extreme Islamization. 
The 1970s were a time of revitalized Islamist extremism throughout the Middle East, the consequences of which we still live with to this day. Throughout Egypt, Syria, Morocco and many other countries, these Islamic extremists were locked into jails as the countries made attempts to somehow get rid of them. Zia al-Haq imported these people that other countries were trying to get rid of because he saw them as the foundation for building a new Islamic conservative nation. The consequences of this decision were catastrophic. India's post-independence journey was also filled with struggles to maintain its founding vision. The legacy of a caste system, religious differences and fanaticism and deep inequality between rich and poor were its main struggles. From independence to 1990, India went through four big anti-Muslim riots and massacres. Hindu nationalism frequently challenges the founding vision of the republic. During the 1980s, the Sikhs found themselves to be the victims of anti-Sikh riots throughout the country. The deep-seated inequality between rich and poor could not be leveled through extensive social programs, and India to this day plays roughshod with its environment and consequently the safety of millions. But, throughout all of this, India is a place where Muslims became presidents, billionaires and influential members of a society in which fundamentally they are legally recognized as equals. 20 years after the anti-Sikh riots that killed thousands, a Sikh would become prime minister. We should not forget, even as the current harmony is being challenged by a revitalized political force of exclusion, discrimination and bigotry, that unlike Pakistan, the vision on which the Indian Republic was built has prevailed. India still is a secular republic as long as they can keep it. The favorite political pastime on the subcontinent for the past 70 years has been to try to undermine and harm your neighbors. Pakistan and India fought four wars. Both countries constantly try to undermine each other. Both countries are nuclear powers and the subcontinent is currently the most likely source for a nuclear war. Most wars have been fought over the region of Kashmir, a Muslim-majority province that used to have a Hindu king. Pakistan lays claim to it because of its Muslim majority, and India because the Hindu king ceded the province to India. In 1962, China invaded to take the northern part of Kashmir from India, which it did to secure its Himalayan borders. And that intervention sort of reveals the actual reason for why there is conflict in that region. Because most Kashmiris, when pulled, don't want to be either part of India or of Pakistan. They want independence. And all parties in this conflict simply ignore this because Kashmir is a key element in the subcontinent's tradition of the politics of antagonizing each other. The Indus River is the single most important geographical feature of Pakistan. It's the country's lifeline, its fresh water supply and the backbone of its agriculture and population centers. However, the Indus does not originate in Pakistan, but in Kashmir. So do the three most important tributary rivers to the Indus as well, the Jhelum, the Chenab and the Sutle. Four of the most important rivers of Pakistan have their origin in Indian controlled land. For you to understand the significance of this, here's a brief intermission on rivers. Rivers are great suppliers of fresh water and nutrition. Rivers are also great borders that limit expansion significantly. And rivers are a great means of transportation. This means that nations that have rivers running through them can project power downstream along the river. In short, if you have a river running through your land, you are at the mercy of those upstream. And by controlling Kashmir, India can project power down four major rivers into Pakistan. India is currently constructing several dam projects, not just for hydroelectric power, but to divert drinking water away from Pakistan. This is an extremely precarious situation for Pakistan, which in return does anything it can do to destabilize Kashmir as much as possible. On the other hand, India can also not allow Kashmir to fall into Pakistani hands, since the hills and lowlands of Jammu lead straight into the population centers of Indian Punjab. Both sides hate each other too much to give up a strategic advantage over the other. The conflict over Kashmir is therefore not really a religious conflict, but a conflict over strategic positioning over the other, and Kashmir finds itself squeezed between the two to this very day.
The previously mentioned disparity of identity between East and West Pakistan developed into an ever-heating tinderbox throughout the 1950s and 1960s, which eventually blew into open war and the worst atrocity of the Indian-Pakistani conflict. The West Pakistani attempt to force their culture, language and dominance over East Pakistan over two decades had the exact opposite effect. The people of Bengal doubled down and identified more and more with their culture and language. A movement of educated young people started to emerge demanding increasing autonomy or possibly even independence, questioning how a country split in two over such distance could even continue. Pakistan responded with the establishment of Islamist militias through the Islamic fanatic party Jamaat-e-Islamiyah, making lists of intellectuals and educated Bangladeshis, and then conducted a purge of society, university professors, university students, lawyers, judges, politicians, doctors, high school teachers, engineers, and anyone with a resemblance of education was hunted down and murdered together with thousands more of innocent people. We do not know the number of how many were killed. The estimates range from 300,000 to 3 million. This Bangladeshi genocide of 1971 would go down as the worst atrocity in the post-independence subcontinent. In the resulting fighting, the Indian army eventually intervened on the side of the Bangladeshi independence movement, helping Bangladesh achieve independence. But the consequences of what happened in 1971 still show their effects to this day. Brain drain is when a country's best educated leave for better prospects abroad. That process harms domestic society and culture. Bangladesh, however, suffered not just a brain drain, but a brain extermination at the hands of the Pakistanis. Entire generations of educated people were murdered, leaving a massive education void in the country, which in return reduced the spread and quality of education in Bangladesh. Bangladesh to this day struggles with extreme poverty as a result. An estimated up to 30 million Bangladeshis work illegally in India to escape the extreme poverty at home and relations between India and Bangladesh are frosty at best, as can be seen by the longest border wall in the world, which India built between it and Bangladesh. Terrorism is the dumbest game a country can play, and if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Every single time a government believed that giving weapons and support to a group of fanatical ideologues who are willing to kill for their delusions was a good idea, it backfired. But for some reason, the people of the Indian subcontinent don't learn that lesson, even though they won the resulting stupid prizes for 50 years. And nobody plays that stupid game as much as Pakistan. But why? In the 1970s, a splinter group of the Indian Communist Party known as the Naxalites split off from the party. Yes, I know you thought that I would be talking about the Taliban, but there is something you most likely don't know, unless you are from India. The largest terrorist organization in the world isn't Islamist, neither is it nationalist or right-wing. The largest terror group in the world is a communist terror group in India called the Naxalites. With between 10,000 to 30,000 members, it's the largest in the world, most active on the eastern coastline of India, where it engages in attacks on government institutions, the police, businesses, the murder of politicians, police officers, and business owners. They came into existence during the 1960s when they were largely supported by Mao Zedong to destabilize India. But after Mao died, it was Pakistan that jumped in to supply weapons and supplies with the sole purpose of destabilizing India. There's no ideological alignment. If you were to try to be a communist in Pakistan, you will most likely end up at the end of a rope. But the Naxalites were a useful tool to keep India in trouble. Within the area in which Naxalite terrorists are active, a substantial amount of India's aluminium, steel, iron, cement and other resource-based industries are based. The Naxalites attack these industry plants and mines, disrupt the economy and are the main reason for continuing economic underdevelopment and lack of industrialization in East India. Since the 1970s, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, the ISI, has developed into an organization specialized in the use of foreign armed groups and terrorist organizations to disrupt and sabotage the ambitions of Pakistan's rivals. As much as you may hear of similar CIA, KGB, FSB, Mossad and Revolutionary Guard activities, none of them come close to what the Pakistani ISI has done and accomplished in this field of secret operations. Which is not to say that India didn't try its hands at such. During the 
the 1970s, it provided support for a nationalist terror group in Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers, who wanted an independent state for the Tamil people. India did this because Sri Lanka was building bridges to India's Cold War rivals and India wished to bully Sri Lanka back into its sphere of influence. However, there are also Tamil people in India who with Tamil Tiger support soon started attacking India and even assassinated an Indian Prime Minister. Again, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. When we look at the Afghan conflict, we often do so from the Euro-American lens, but it is a good idea to take these glasses off. This conflict is far older than the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It's also worth reminding ourselves that even though the Americans provided weapons and money, they gave them to the Pakistani ISI. And it was Pakistan who took these weapons, created the Taliban and gave the weapons to the Taliban. But why? Was it really just to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan? No. Afghanistan's relationship with Pakistan has been called since the beginning. As soon as Pakistan declared independence in 1947, Afghanistan engaged in a policy of trying to destabilize Pakistan. It allied itself with India and supported insurgents crossing into Pakistan to destabilize it. The reason is the before-mentioned Durand Line, Pakistan's western border that cuts through cultures and languages without making any sense. Afghanistan never recognized that border. Afghan and leaders have considered much of West Pakistan, especially Pashtunistan, to actually belong to it, and on occasion even laid claim to Balochistan. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Afghanistan frequently attempted to incite secessionist rebellions in Pakistan and even conducted military incursions. And that conflict worsened when the Afghan kingdom was replaced by a socialist republic allied to the Soviet Union, because the Soviets supported Afghanistan's claims to Pakistani land. This is when Pakistan decided that it had to destabilize Afghanistan, and it did so by training and sending Islamist insurgents years before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. The Americans merely involved themselves in something because it was at the time directed against the Soviets, but had no idea of the wider implications or that this was more a conflict between India and Pakistan than a Middle Eastern conflict. However, the stupid game Pakistan played to secure their national sovereignty won them an extremely stupid prize. Islamism doesn't care about national sovereignty or borders. Once the Pakistani-backed Taliban secured power over Afghanistan, they turned their attention elsewhere. They launched a terror campaign against Iran, whose Shia population they considered to be infidels. This soured relations between Pakistan and Iran, but also turned their sights on Pakistan, creating an offshoot there that started terrorizing the Pakistanis. Pakistan Pakistan, however, keeps continuing its support for terrorist organizations that destabilize Afghanistan, even though those in return support organizations that destabilize Pakistan. Because a stable Afghanistan that can assert itself on the international stage is a threat to Pakistan's sovereignty and potentially its very existence. One of India's biggest ambitions beside an internal integration through highways, railroads and security is to find a way out. It wants to become a big market, producer and leader with global recognition. And to do so, it has to find ways out into the world. One of the things it needs to do most is to feed the increasingly high energy demand of its growing population. Renewable energy should be an option, but even though India makes promises on that sector, it mostly slacks behind. What it therefore craves the most is natural gas and oil. And not too far away, there's a lot of natural gas amongst the stands. Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan sit on some of the largest natural gas reserves in the world, and all of them are eager to sell. Russia, unfortunately, has enough of its own. Europe has several obstacles in the way. The Middle East has its own. There's a large desert between it and China, so the ideal destination would be India. Remember that corridor which most invaders of India used to use? That same corridor is now one of India's biggest interests to get out into the world. Both India and the Central Asian stands want to have closer ties. 70% of India's energy comes from abroad, which is why India would like to be able to buy gas from the stands. The stands, for their part, are landlocked nations who would enjoy a route to the sea, something India could provide. India and the stands have very warm diplomatic relations, as both sides see nothing but benefits in an internal integration and closer ties. India would be Central Asia's gateway to the world, and Central 
Asia would provide energy and markets. However, someone stands in the way of that common dream. A gas pipeline, rail track and highway connecting the two regions would have to go through Pakistan and Afghanistan, which Pakistan has consistently made impossible, even though Pakistan itself would be set up to profit from such an arrangement. On the other side of the subcontinent, there would have been another source of energy. Burma has some of the largest natural gas fields in Southeast Asia. Both countries quickly agreed to build a pipeline and a trade deal. However, this time something else came in the way. The pipeline would have gone through Bangladesh, to which Bangladesh agreed. When a pipeline goes through a country, that country deserves regular payouts in transit fees by both the recipient and deliverer to the pipeline. And because Bangladesh is a poor country, it negotiated for a high transit fee that caused the project to fail. Rather than trying to smooth the situation out by offering economic relief and agreements to Bangladesh, India instead proposed an enormous large pipeline that would have gone around Bangladesh. The consequent constant year-long tedious haggling eventually was too much for the Burmese, who instead made a deal selling their gas through a pipeline to China. In many ways, this failure to agree serves as an example of how India treats Bangladesh like a poorhouse and how these two countries that could both profit from a closer integration of trade and agreements fail to do so. And on the other side of the subcontinent, it shows how deep the conflicts in that region go for India and who has what interests where. As Pakistan continues to control and shut down that corridor, there will be increasingly more potential for conflict in that region. Which leaves India with only one other way to get out and seek more influence in the world. With 7,516 kilometers or 4,671 miles of coastline, you would imagine that India is the unquestionable power in the Indian Ocean. However, that is not the case, and you will soon see why. One thing that can be said with certainty about India and the Indian Ocean is that it is in a better position than its rival. Pakistan has 1,050 kilometers or 650 miles of coastline. Its coastline might be closer to the important ports of the Gulf. However, most of that coastline is in Balochistan, a rebellious province with armed insurrections and a struggle for independence. The Baloch coastline is also believed to contain natural gas fields. Pakistan's solution to try to keep this coastline and internal security within Balochistan is an extremely risky one. They outsourced the problem to the Chinese. They sold the natural harbors to China and permitted China to build a highway from Kashgar to Gwadar, connecting the isolated western Chinese regions to the Indian Ocean. This may bring investments, but is also extremely risky for Pakistan, as it makes China continuously invested and interested in the security of the region. If China is invested in the security of that region, the population may resent such. Additionally, who is to say that China will always side with the central government in the future? If the Chinese harbor in Gwadar becomes more important than the needs of the Pakistani government, China might be okay with Balochi separatists as long as they don't touch the Chinese harbor. India, meanwhile, is trying to outfox them both with treaties with Iran to build ports, highways and possibly even pipelines into Afghanistan through Iran. But back to India. For it, control over the Indian Ocean is not only vital to its security interests, but essential to its ambitions of becoming a superpower. To the west lies the Arabian Sea, to the east lie the Straits of Malacca, which lead to the South China Sea. This connects some of the largest global trade routes in the world between the Middle East, Africa, Europe, to Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia and Australia. Half the world's trade in oil is conducted on Indian Ocean sea routes and the total value of all trade conducted on the Indian Ocean routes probably lies in the trillions. And most of this trade goes through a place that has for a very long time been ignored. Sri Lanka is of similar geopolitical significance as the Strait of Hormuz, the Malacca Straits or the Suez Canal. However, for decades nobody cared much about that place as it found itself in a decades-long civil war with the Tamil Tigers that nobody wanted to get involved with. The Tamil Tigers would open fire on ships that came too close, so most maritime trade networks went far around Sri Lanka. However, now that the civil war is over, Sri Lanka is back in the limelight, and three countries are lining up for its favor and to try to move it into their own sphere of influence. China already built a harbor there, but the crown 
crown jewel in what Sri Lanka has to offer is a little known place called Trincomalee. Trincomalee is the third largest natural harbour in the world, as well as one of the deepest harbours in the world. This means it is one of the few places in the Indian Ocean that can be used as a submarine base. Add to that the fact that it lies at the convergence of four out of seven of the world's most important trade routes and you have the attention of every major power that would like to have a base there. Sri Lanka may at first seem to be in an enviable position, where everyone would like to offer it whatever they can to be its friend, but Sri Lanka also has to be careful to not be taken advantage of. The geopolitical interests of free powers collide in this region. Indian, Chinese and American. For the Americans, the region is vital to its interests in the Middle East, as it is the Pacific fleet that is used to secure American interests in the region. As such, the Americans have a large military presence in the region and have to continuously secure safe passage for its Pacific fleet into the Indian Ocean. The Chinese want to control the Indian Ocean. As such, they are building ports and navy bases throughout the region and manage to get a head start over the Indians. The Indians, for their part, have recently stepped up by increasing investment in Sri Lanka and by building its first foreign military bases. The Indian Navy is also being steadily increased and built up as India pursues the role of being the dominant power in an ocean named after the subcontinent. Only 4% of India's exports go to its direct neighbours, and only 0.5% of its imports come from there. Despite founding SARC, an organisation for trade and cooperation for the Indian subcontinent modelled on the European Union, the countries in it were unable to overcome geopolitical differences and conflicts to build an internal integration of trade and supply with common interests among nations on the subcontinent. This is a hard start for a country in the world stage, as it requires it to go out and find external integration with foreign trade partners and allies. In that pursuit, India has some great advantages. It is seen and by and large is one of China's biggest regional rivals. As such, India is the place to go if you seek to find a partner to work with within competition to China. Its role as a country fighting Islamic terrorism and being a geopolitical rival of China resulted in ever increasing and closer ties to the United States. In seeking outside markets, one of its closest friends has been Japan with who they attempted to build a maritime trade network into Africa to rival China. India is also an outside quasi-observing member of ASEAN, with the intention of establishing an East Asian to India trade corridor that could rival China. It is also building ever closer ties to Australia by forming an organization for the surveillance and safety and control of the Indian Ocean. India started building ever closer ties to Israel with common strategic and military interests. Israel provides military training and support in anti-terror tactics and signed its largest arms deal with India, where Russian Kalashnikovs are being phased out and replaced by Israeli weapons. This close and ever-increasing military cooperation between Israel and India is largely unnoticed by the world, and even more curious when you keep in mind that India has a close relationship with Iran, which is mainly due to Iran's relationship with Pakistan being icy at best. And in Europe, India is building ever closer ties with France while retaining a friendly relationship with Russia. So of all countries of the subcontinent, India has one of the easiest foreign policy positions to be in. It's welcomed practically everywhere and has many things to look forward to. Pakistan has a far harder time on the global stage. When it gained independence, its founders, in a very smart move, allied the country with the United States. Both the Soviet Union and India wished to undermine Pakistan and possibly even have it dissolved. Allying with the United States gave the country a security shield against that. But its consequent foreign engagements have greatly isolated Pakistan and damaged its reputation in the world. The destabilization of Afghanistan through Islamist militias had far-reaching consequences. One of the first things the Taliban did after they captured Kabul in 1998 was to storm the Iranian embassy and massacre its staff. This was only 20 years after the Iranian hostage crisis, so most of the world reacted with a well, how do you like it when it's done to you, and forgot about it. But it is important to remember that the Taliban, who were just as brutal as its modern offshoots, launched a campaign of extermination against the Shias and conducted terrorist attacks in Iran. 
all of it with support of the Pakistani state and with such brutality that Iran almost invaded Afghanistan themselves between 1998 and 2001. The Iranians have neither forgotten nor forgiven the Pakistanis for their role in all of this and prefer working with India instead. When the Americans came to Afghanistan, the Pakistanis offered themselves as trusted allies in that conflict. However, the money and weapons the Americans gave to Pakistan were used to enlarge the Pakistani nuclear weapons program instead, and much worse to support the Taliban, who the Americans were fighting themselves. Continued Pakistani support for the Taliban and destabilization of Afghanistan caused an opium crisis and Taliban offshoots that destabilized Pakistan itself and caused more and more anger towards it by the Americans, Afghans and Iranians. But to the Pakistani leadership, a stable Afghanistan was a threat to its own security, so they proceeded, thereby however pushing Afghanistan more and more into India's sphere of influence. India is by now building infrastructure and training the Afghan army and is the most likely country to take a leading role in that region once the Americans pull out. And it was within that context that the United States experienced one of their biggest diplomatic embarrassments in 2008, when Islamist terror groups conducted massive terror attacks with many casualties against the Indian embassy in Kabul and the Indian city of Mumbai. Years later, the Snowden leaks revealed what many had suspected. The Americans had started getting suspicious over their supposed allies years before, so they had started surveilling the equipment they gave to the Pakistanis to fight Islamists and found that the Pakistanis were giving American assets to Islamic terror groups and worse, that these American assets had been used in those terror attacks against India. But instead of condemnation by India, what happened instead is a strengthening of ties between the two, as India offered a more reliable friendship. And through that, Pakistan lost its American friends, most of its influence in Afghanistan, and gave its arch enemy more power. Pakistan even has trouble finding new friends. When it helped the North Koreans develop a nuclear program, most of East Asia turned its back on them. Even possible new friends such as Russia and Turkey turned their backs on Pakistan, since both these countries have terrorism problems and want nothing to do with countries that support terror groups. Leaving Pakistan with only two friends, a Saudi Arabia to which Pakistan is only as useful as its nuclear weapons program in relation to Iran's nuclear weapons program, and China to which Pakistan is less of a friend but more like a stick with which it can poke India. Pakistan's friendship with China is also strenuous since most of the Islamic world is not happy about China's treatment of Muslims. And this consequently made Pakistan even fewer friends in the Islamic club of countries. In foreign policy, Pakistan stands alone and has the most difficult position on the subcontinent. It is distrusted and isolated and has to rebuild trust wherever it can. Going forward, these countries will face continuous challenges. India has ambitions of becoming a superpower, while being hampered by problems such as basic sanitation and catastrophic pollution at home. Bangladesh will have to find a way to overcome its crippling poverty. Sri Lanka will have to be careful to not be taken advantage of by outsiders who seek influence in the region through its advantageous position. And Pakistan is one of the most distrusted places in the world, for which it however has nobody else to blame but itself. What they all have in common is is that they look at external integration and outside solutions for their internal demands and struggles, thereby continuing a further disintegration of the subcontinent. The Indian subcontinent is a place where all its inhabitants would benefit greatly if they could put their conflicts aside, but that, for the foreseeable future, is not going to happen as the politics of antagonizing and conflict are set to continue. In the next video, we will be talking about Turkey, in a one or two hour long video about its role in the 20th century, the founding of the Republic, and how its ambitions will shape our futures. There will also be a shorter video about the American lens and how it distorts perception of the world and can thereby contribute to conflicts. If you wish to have a say in which topics I should cover in the future, you should consider becoming a patron, as the patrons are who vote from a long list of topics on what I should cover next. I hope you all liked this video summary, I tried to not go into too much detail. If you believed there should have been more detail, I could do some more videos later, going more into detail about every single country individually. I certainly now own the books to do so. Speaking of which, you will find a bibliography in the description of all the books used. Don't forget to keep this channel running by sharing the video and supporting me through PayPal or Patreon, and I hope to see you all soon again.